Okay. Ladies and gents, if you could grab your seats, please, as quickly as possible. We're going to kick off the next session as quickly as we can. If you could take your seats now, uh, that would be really useful. Thanks very much, and we'll get started for the afternoon. Now you have been recaffeinated uh, and recharged for even more questions. Okay, now I'm going to have to roust up my panel, get them ready and prepared. Um, we are um, moving on to the next uh, panel session. And um, this panel discussion is, uh, is titled Looking at Sustainable Investment Options for Institutional Investors. What are the challenges in finding large-scale, good quality, renewable energy investments? And how can we overcome these challenges? Uh, it's a fascinating subject, big topic. Uh, we have an excellent panel here to address that. My um, name is Hugh Whelan. I'm the managing editor of... Uh, 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 an online magazine called Responsible Investor. Um, I've been a, a financial journalist for 20 years, working for a number of different uh, newspapers over that time. Uh, we also have a, a print magazine called ESG Magazine, which you may have seen, which is quarterly. Um, that's enough of who we are, but I would encourage you to go and take a look uh, at uh, www.responsible-investor.com. Enough of a plug. Let's move on to our panelists. Um, We've got a fabulous mix, really, of uh, different uh, disciplines in uh, the ESG and, and, um, uh, and mainstream financial area as well. I'm going to introduce them. I just have to figure out where they're sat so I can introduce them properly. To my left, uh, we have Manuel Adamini. Uh, Manuel is the Director of Investment Outreach and Partners Program at the Climate Bonds Initiative. He'll tell us about, uh, about what that is and what it does. Uh, next to Manuel, we have Peli Pedersen, Responsible Investment Analyst at uh, PKA in Denmark. Again, uh, Pella will tell us uh, what PKA is, but uh, uh, it's a very big pension fund from Denmark. Uh, he'll tell us more. Uh, next to Pella, we have Jochen Vermut, uh, founder and CIO of Vermut Asset Management. Not sure where he got the name from, but uh, uh, great to have um, Jochen here with us. And, uh, and to the left of Jochen, uh, we have uh, Hendrik Gartz. Great to have Hendrik here. Director of Thematic Research at Sustainalytics. Um, he'll tell us all about Sustainalytics. But I think we'll kick off. Um, I've asked each of the panelists to give us a very rapid um, explanation of who they are and what their organizations do so we can get into discussion as quickly as possible about the meat uh, of what we want to talk about here. And we're really keen on getting your input, your questions, uh, good, bad, or ugly. Uh, we'll try and take as many of those as possible. Uh, Pella, over to you. Talk to us about uh, PKA and what you do on the low carbon transition. I think we've got enough mics. We don't have to, we don't have to pass them around. We can, we can. Is on? <laughs> okay, perfect. Hi, great to be here. Um, yeah, my name is Pelle and I work at PKA, a Danish pension fund. Um, and um, yeah, very briefly, we, we represent 275,000 members in, in Denmark uh, from the healthcare sector. And on their behalf, we manage $32 billion. So a rather large pension fund in, in Denmark. And in terms of climate change, um, our members are very keen for PKA to support the transition to a low carbon economy. So for that reason, climate change has been a focus area for many years, many years. Um, and that has led us to invest 2.3 billion euros into climate projects. And that range from wind farms to green bonds to yeah, our own energy renovation fund to the Danish Climate Investment Fund. And we aim to invest 10% of our capital into climate projects by 2020, um, which I believe is, is quite ambitious. We're not there yet, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get there. Um, in, in terms of climate change, we also look at climate change risk, which we believe is rather important for, for our portfolio, particularly going forward. So we have divested from coal mining companies, and in 2016, we'll also be looking at the rest of the fossil fuel industry, meaning the oil and gas industry in particular. Um, we also do active ownership, so we engage with companies uh, on how they integrate climate change risk into their business plans. We also uh, engage with policymakers all over the world in order to support uh, investor-friendly um, schemes to invest in a green future. So to sum up, what we do investments, uh, divestment, active ownership, and public policy. And we just came out number six in uh, the survey by Asset Owners Disclosure Project. And WWF, third year in a row, ranked us as the most climate-friendly pension fund in, in Denmark. 
So we've been doing a lot, but we're not yet, not yet there. That's really useful because I've seen quite a few WWF people here. So if you were lowly, Danish if you were lowly ranked, you'd be in trouble. Um, talk to us about the investment rationale for the green investments that you do as a pension fund for the benefit of the people here in the audience. Why, why do you do them um, and why do you have a 10% target? Well, I think it's actually quite simple. Um, in our investment strategy, we are obliged to look for new projects where we're able to combine, of course, market returns with climate considerations. So that's actually quite simple. Um, so that's approved by, by the boards and our members, again, um, they're very keen for us to support um, climate investments. So just if you were at our AGM, sometimes 40, 50 percent of the questions relate to sustainability. Um, and we have a very ongoing dialogue with our members. Um, we don't face the same kind of pressure as other pension funds do because um, we've had that kind of discussion with our members for years. So for instance, we have um, uh, 800 delegates at PK, uh, elected members, and we once they are elected, um, they go to a three-day course where we describe how we, how we invest, describe how we approach climate changes, um, and given that we have that kind of dialogue with our members, um, we, we don't face the same pressure. And that's very beneficial for us in our work. And at the same time, we have um, uh, the mandate we have from our boards enable us to really uh, use resources to explore new opportunities within this space. So in 2012, we established our own private equity fund called uh, PKA, Alternative Investment Partners. And they manage 4 billion euros um, on our behalf. Um, and they are highly specialized experts within um, infrastructure investments. Um, so they have been in charge of, of, of doing our, uh, in total, five offshore wind farms, the latest one in, in UK, together with uh, Lego. Um, so that's sort of the rationale. Um, when, you, when we look at climate change risk, and that's a, a sort of what we not do, uh, how we exclude companies, um, I think what investors have to do is basically ask themselves what is going to work in the future. And using an unrenewable resource is of course not going to work. So at some point, the transition will take place. We just don't know when. Um, and that's the big issues, issue for, for investors today. How do, you, how do you take the right steps in, in the right pace? That, that's a really big issue. So what we did in terms of coal, um, we decided to exclude pure coal mining companies. And we could see just one year after that, the three largest coal mine, coal mine producers in the US, Arch Coal, Peabody, Alpha Natural Resources, they all filed for bankruptcy. So here you have a situation where you get traction within your organization and you are actually able to say to your members that it makes sense to take these steps. So as I mentioned before, particularly in 2016, we will look at the oil sector. But oil is not oil, so it's a lot more sophisticated to look at the oil sector than the coal sector. Just a couple of related questions, Pelle. Um, what the financial um, arguments, the, the financial rationale that underpin the infrastructure investments that mm. you've made in renewables? I mean, sometimes the arguments outside are these investments don't really make money in comparison to the opportunity cost we would have with other investments. That's, that's a, some, a criticism you hear quite regularly. You obviously think that that's not right. Um, so certainly, um, we, if we look at the, the current interest levels, um, you get zero percent. Just yesterday, the, the German Bund is turned negative. Um, and we, when we invest in, say, wind farms, we tend to get seven to nine percent a year. I think that's quite attractive, and that's one of the reasons we've invested 1.4 billion euros in wind farms. Um, so I think that's that's the financial case for you there. Um, I think it's a rather easy question. What was said by, by APG is also, do you have the know-how, the knowledge to move into these kinds of investments? Because that's, that's essential um, in order to understand the risks you have when, when investing in these kinds of uh, projects. And the other thing that's held up is that governments are going to take away subsidies which have made these things profitable. But what if they decided to take away subsidies uh, to the fossil fuel industry? That's also a question uh, I think it's important to, to ask. Um, but when we look at infrastructure investments in yeah, particular Europe, we look for a political stable environment, of course, as you do investor, um, a stable macroeconomic environment. Um, and you should guess that that 
was easy to find in, in a European context, but not always. Um, just look at what uh, the Danish government decided to do two weeks ago to cancel 350 megawatts of coastal um, wind turbines because they say the transition to a low-carbon economy is, is too expensive. But what policymakers tend to do is that they forget all the benefits of transition to, to a green economy. Um, and and that's, uh, that the kind of instability is poison um, for the development of, of new projects. And I think that's really one of the issues, project development, because we have the money ready, we want to invest more into, into renewables, whether it's wind or solar. Um, we want to invest both in, in Europe and emerging countries, but we lack project development. Okay, great. Thanks, Pella. Let's, um, let's some, some interesting points to come back on there, but let's move on to, um, I think we'll go to Manuel now. Talk to us, Manuel, about, uh, for the benefit of those who might not know, a very quick uh, helicopter view of the Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, and David mentioned earlier the growth of the climate bonds market, green bonds. Uh, wh where are things at, at the moment and where, it, where is that uh, market projected to go in your view in the next one to three years? Thank you. Um, is this on? Yeah. Thank you. Well, the Climate Bonds Initiative, the executive summary is all in the name. We're on climate and we're on bonds. Um, we're doing four things there. One is to mobilize the market. Two, provide data and information. Three, run a standards program about defining what is green. And four, work with partners in a formal way. Let me very quickly run through these. Mobilize the market has been one of our key activities since we've been out there since 2009 when the IIB indeed kick-started this market with our climate awareness bonds. It's, you know, bringing people together, making them enthusiastic about it, have discussions like today. Then you move to two, when you see that people become enthusiastic about this product, they want to know more. They want to have information, detailed information about what does the market look like, how big it is, what's going on where. Maybe have sp specialized information, for example, we issue not only our annual flagship publication, the State of the Market Report, that's kindly, sp kindly sponsored by HBC, which is an overview of the whole market. But also, for example, we have specialized reports in China, written up in Mandarin to make it very accessible in the, in the relevant market. This is the type of information people want to have once they are enthusiastic about this. And we also provide data about the labeled green bonds to index makers. The third one is standards. So define what is green and make sure there's a like a fair trade logo out there, standards mechanism. The FT just ran a big article today, another, another one last week, saying there isn't a standard out there to define that's green. Well, that's not right. There is one. And uh, the last one is working with partners in a structured way with us through his partnership scheme. Just, uh, I sort of jumped ahead of myself a little bit, but is everyone in the audience well up with what green bonds are? Is that, is that a sort of given here, that everyone knows how green bonds work? I guess it is, fine. No one seems to be screaming at the back. No, I never... There's one person, okay. We'll, we'll see you afterwards, um, we'll <laughs> given that it's only one. But uh, just, um, um, actually, it's worthwhile, Manuel, just, just if you, uh, you, your very quick description of how green bond money is being used, just, just give, me, give us a really quick definition of green bonds, yep. for everyone's sake. Not to make things complicated, the majority of the market is plain vanilla debt instruments. So it's just senior unsecured loans, where say an issuer... I'm going to row you back there. Make it even simpler than that. <laughs> OK. <laughs> an issuer, let's say a corporate, let's say Apple. They just came forward with a, big, uh, with a big bond. Or let's say Toyota. They pull 500 million out of institutional debt capital markets and tell those investors what they will use the money for, green stuff climate stuff that makes a climate bond it's much better when you get to green stuff that 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 definitely does the explanation i knew you like okay, that yeah yeah <laughs> okay so um uh, just tell us where we're at on, on the number of companies and organizations entities that have borrowed money from investors for green for, for green finance projects where are we at with that what what kind of green stuff is being done and how much green stuff is being done. Okay. We have roughly 120 billion US dollars outstanding now. Issuance this year was roughly 30 billion and expected to, to be anything between 50 and 100 billion, probably the high end of it, given China moves into the market. That's the size of the market where issuers say that this is green. There's much more there which 
probably is at least as green, but nobody yeah. says so. That's what we call the climate aligned bonds universe. Last year estimated, as of 10 June last year, roughly 600 billion. We will issue our next report on the 1st of July at HSBC, and it will be much more than that probably. We're talking at least 400 issuers last year, many more this year probably, at least 2,800 deals, this wider universe. If you look at the labeled green bonds, so where the issuer says this is green, some greener than others, we can talk about that later, we are again talking about hundreds of deals and this roughly $120 billion figure outstanding. We saw this development spread globally. First, it was a market dominated by supranational agent, supranationals and agencies like the World Bank, IFC, EIB and others, and state actors. Two, three years ago, the corporates kicked in. GDF Suez, now called NG, Toyota, Electricité de France. This year, you saw big names like Apple and Starbucks changing the game. In the US, the US first only had a very lively municipal market on green bond. Now you see those big corporates move in. We saw bonds out of Mexico. Clearly, China and India really whopper deals this year. Roughly half of the new issuance, huge ones. And it's spreading globally. This is quality. You know, we have quantity. has been grown from 3 to 14, 36, 42, now 100 billion probably this year. And we see quality. So more deals from different types of issuers all over the place, spreading globally. We see different types of deals, not only the plain vanilla, the easy financial structures, but also project bonds, securitizations, and other stuff. So this is adding quality to the market. And we see, maybe to conclude on that, a whole ecosystem of service providers around this. We have Sustainalytics over here. There's many more. The big four looking into this, that's quality of the market. Great. Thanks for that, Manuel. Um, plenty of thoughts to come back on there as well. Um, let's bring in um, Dr. Hendrik Gartz, not Dr. Doctor, but Dr. Hendrik Gartz um, from Sustainalytics. Um, for the benefit of the, the audience, and while you're checking, your mic is on. Uh, just, just tell us what a sustainability rating agency does, um, just in case there are many people who don't, are not that familiar uh, with w the kind of work you do. Uh, and then um, answer the question about where you fit in with um, the, the challenge of finding large-scale, good quality, renewable energy investment opportunities. Um, what, what, do, what do you mean for that? For that? Let's, let's just talk about what do you mean for the energy transition, low carbon? So obviously the second part of the question is a more difficult one. So uh, thanks, uh, Manuel, for mentioning us already. So let me start with this uh, green stuff uh, thing. So uh, part of what we do is uh, we provide uh, second opinions in the green bond uh, issuance process. So uh, part of our client base are uh, corporates, but only a very small part, I have to say. So maybe I start with the core business. Um, obviously, um, yeah or we are an ESG research and rating house. What does that mean? Uh, first of all, it means uh, that we provide ratings um, on ESG exposures or performances of uh, companies in the first place, also of countries. These ratings are used by institutional investors to uh, integrate them in their investment decision making, in their portfolio decisions. Um, yeah, most of our clients, we have round about 400 clients globally, uh, are asset managers, round about 60%. Uh, there's a, uh, we have seen APG is one of our clients, for example. List looks like a kind of who is who in the investment market. So uh, the trend is that other that uh, investors have multiple providers. So we are not the exclusive providers of research and ratings to these big investors. Um, but of course, we have also over the years experienced a lot of growth in the business. Um, um, as said, uh, the number of, of clients, we have also grown in terms of uh, the number of people we employ. We have 300 uh, employees uh, currently, around about, globally. So, and Sustainalytics is, uh, I would say, belongs to the two big players in the market. 
together with uh, MCI, uh, ESG Research. Um, these are the two biggest players. There are a couple of others, uh, of course, as well. Um, yeah, so that's uh, a little bit little bit of background. So I'm heading, as uh, Hugh said already, the globally the thematic research team. And of course, uh, providing um, thought leadership pieces is, is one of our, let's say, side activities, uh, uh, informing our company research. And certainly, we are also looking at, at carbon. Uh, for example, our uh, yearly outlook, kind of yearly outlook we produce uh, every year, uh, looked at the results of uh, COP21 and the implications. So this is more indir indirect effects we are having on the discussion. Um, and certainly, uh, we are also acting as consultants for our uh, investor uh, clients. So we uh, consult them when they set up their investment processes, how to integrate ESG, how to integrate our uh, uh, the information that we provide. Um, so which is the ratings are indicator based and certainly we have indicators that speak to the carbon topic. We have heard some of them. Uh, some indicators might be of limited use like the carbon footprint. I fully, fully agree here that this is only a little part of uh, what one should look at, maybe only in an exposure context, not so much in a performance context. Um, yeah, so indirectly via our ratings, we have an impact on portfolio uh, structures. Uh, the degree is, of course, questionable. Um, our clients are responsible investor clients, so uh, I would also doubt the size of uh, the percentage number that has been mentioned, the 30%, certainly also include um, yeah, assets under management that just have single um, integrate our screening criteria integrated in their processes so uh, it's debatable if you want to call that a responsible investment so the question is of course was what is the impact does it have an impact uh, um, yeah in the secondary market if uh, you the topic of divestment but also of portfolio structuring uh, what impact does it have actually on the real economy uh, the E&S or the environmental impact of that. Timo uh, Bush has shown the real numbers of CO2 emissions, which are uh, still uh, increasing despite all the effort uh, that has been undertaken also by the investment community. So that's one part. And coming to the uh, central question of today, um, of course, I also ask myself why um, I'm sitting here <laughs> on the panel. And uh, because certainly... Looking at the primary market, our impact is much more uh, limited. Yeah, I've talked briefly about the green bond stuff. Here we talk maybe about fresh capital that is going into projects. Here you can make the link maybe. And uh, prospectively, uh, of course, when you think about some of the challenges, uh, so I looked at the research that has, for example, been published by the OECD on the question of uh, challenges or obstacles. And certainly one is, and this has also uh, been said by the ABP representative speaking earlier, the lack of knowledge and also the lack of transparency in this market. So uh, people struggle a little bit uh, about how to evaluate uh, projects. Uh, and certainly as an ESG research specialist, uh, of course, we would have some competitive advantages in providing relevant research and supporting uh, investment decisions. So Just other than that, I see only a limited, limited role here uh, that goes beyond our, let's say, also engagement activity. We advise our uh, clients on, um, so talking uh, helping them to to engage with companies on the carbon topic. That is, of course, also another indirect channel via which we can have an impact. So, so you, I mean, you've been part of a movement that has started to put together a lot more financial data around environmental, social, and governance issues um, to enable investors to take investment decisions by thinking about those issues also, um, by um, looking at green bonds and how green they are and assessing them. I mean, how, how, much, um, how much more of that kind of information is out there now and being considered by big investors? I mean, you, 
the yeah, talk I mean, is that there's a lot, but but what's your view, mm -hmm. Hendrik? Do you think that do you think they are actually looking at this kind of information um, to yep. base financial decisions on? Yeah. So first of all, I think there's a general move in the responsible investment market as well as in the ratings market towards uh, materiality, financial materiality. Yeah? So uh, it's also reflected in how we develop. Um, that means uh, we are currently working on um, innovation in the sense that we develop a rating system that that focuses on financial materiality, on the business impact of, of ESG issues, which is easier said than, than done, of course. There are a lot of... Uh, uncertainties and 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 uh, also uh, situations where you cannot you know it's not natural science where you can only make qualitative uh, assessment and links between uh, e uh, ESG factors and financial performance but we are um, we are systematically trying to make the case um, and um, this is reflected in, in in the rating process but also in the way how investors think about it. We talked about uh, today uh, asset owners with their fiduciary duties and it was also said by the ABP uh, representative at the end and that uh, relates to what we talked today about. At the end it, it is all about the risk return profile of these uh, projects. I doubt that there's a lack of capital. We have the low interest rate environment so uh, for sure there's a big appetite on projects with a favorable uh, risk return profile. So I see I see the the biggest uh, challenges here in the institutional environment that is actually not made for uh, these uh, investments. So it's more focusing on public equity, public debt, and so on and so forth. So here, institutional investors are not really uh, well positioned to more strongly allocate their funds uh, towards a project type of and asset financing, uh, so that is uh, is lacking here from my point of view. Great, thanks for that, Andrew. Let, we'll, let's come back to that. We'll bring in Jochen now, uh, and we'll come back to that, um, which is really the nub of the question uh, in some ways, that's the, the sort of overarching question uh, to the panel. But Jochen, um, talk to us about uh, Vermut Asset Management and uh, about impact investing for those who are not um, so familiar. What, what, does, what does impact investing mean? Um, thank you very much. So we, um, when I uh, used to, uh, as my father says, go to the demonstrations against nuclear power because the cute girls were there, I kept on getting carried away. And I thought I'll do a Bloomberg, do math, physics, economics, become rich, donate to Greenpeace and be a good guy. And then one day came along and said, you're sponsoring three quarter of the Greenpeace budget Russia, but you're making your money investing in Luke oil. So I said, what's the problem? I don't see any conflict. And then my wife, who so was a Greenpeace activist, took me to the north of Russia. And we saw how in the spring the, the ice melts and the oil spills into the Arctic. And the amount of oil spills equals the amount that BP spilled in the Gulf of Mexico. And to get it off the rivers, the locals started shoveling it off. And they invited us to do it for half an hour. And sure enough, I threw up because it's poisonous. And when you put gas into your car, you do that at a cheap price because a company like Luke Oil takes the death by cancer of hundreds and thousands of people at cost. So I decided maybe there is a conflict. There's a materiality and issue yeah, out there. There's a small issue there. The investment parlance. <laughs> so, uh, so a guy called Charlie Kleisner, who was a partner of uh, Steve Jobs, uh, encouraged me to join a network called Tonic, and within that network, uh, a group called 100% Impact, where we said we would go across all of our asset allocation as a family office, and in each case set out a target in which we would have a positive net impact, and then measure that going forward. So the key thing on impact is intentionality. And we at Impact Investing used to think of the ESG guys as the softies, you know, they're not really serious. Because BP, as you may know, is 95% ESG compliant. Completely useless as far as I'm concerned. So impact investing number one. Within impact investing then we have a subgroup called Divest Invest, which launched, as you know, with very little thanks to the help of Carbon Tracker and the world economy exploded in commitments. There was a few hundred million commitments in 2011, a few students. By the summer of 2014, we had commitments of $50 billion, including the Rockefeller family. And we set a really ambitious target to go for $150 billion by COP21. And what happened, thanks to the activists in this room, uh, uh, 
and the amazing perspective that was given to us by David uh, is that uh, people started noticing, and by COP we got to 3.4 trillion commitments to divest, a huge move. And why did it happen? It happened because we are, I think, or I'm, I'm certain, at the brink of a new industrial revolution, a revolution where everything we used to know is no longer valid, and only people like Pele will survive and all other dinosaurs will disappear, as did the uh, horses in 1900. The first Dow Jones Index only had steam engine rail companies. In 1900, at Easter Day Parade, there were only horse-drawn carriages on Wall Street or in München or in Berlin. 13 years later, there wasn't a horse carriage to be seen. The whole world was on cars on this hot day. And in the index, all the companies disappeared. So what we do is we, as a family office and investment advisor, manage across all asset classes with an impact, number one. Number two, we ask ourselves the question, how can we stop climate change? And here, the amazing figure that Jürgen Randers puts forward, Jürgen Randers was initial author of the Club of Rome report, and now a report called 2052. And he says, I smile because my wife tells me to do so, but I'm a depressed man. We only need about 200 euros per person in the developed world per year to stop climate change, and we're unwilling to do it. How stupid can humanity be? Yeah? And I said, well, that's a very small number. And then I worked out the number. It turns out that if I, Jochen, collect 20 billion euros, which is a lot, but not if I have Pelle help me, or the RAG Stiftung with 30 billion, or APG with 600 billion, with 20 billion euro in equity, because that's what we're missing, I can get 10 billion euros of support from the EIB. I can use leverage and plaster northern Germany with 200 billion euros of solar panels. Doing that five times over for 25 years, I can cut all of German emissions with just 20 billion euros to start with. As Germany is 3% of global emissions, we need to do this 33 times worldwide over. We just need 600 billion euros in equity. That's just APG. That's just the Norwegian pension fund. And we're done. Climate change is as I used to work at Deutsche Bank, peanuts. You know, it really is peanuts. We can do this. And it's such an amazing story. David really changed my vision of the world. It's not a few evil guys. It's us. We can make a difference. Each of us is an impact investor, of course, because if you have a bank account at Berliner Sparkasse, your two euros there are being lent to some cluster bombing guys or some coal company, and you don't know, so you should change your bank account to a green account. So what we try to do is get big pension funds to give us a bit of equity, and then we stop climate change. Okay, Jochen, if it's so easy, why haven't the governments done it? And why don't you lobby the governments to do it and stay away from pension fund money? <laughs> well, it's... Yeah. Uh, it governments could also do it uh, very easily, yeah? They so could. it's the same calculation. So ask Mr. Schäuble, uh, it would not be a big deal, right? Correct. So if ABP can do it, um, our government could also do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Isn't Germany doing it anyway? No, no, isn't, we're, we're, isn't that what the energy vendor will do? Or no, no, Germany is... Uh, misunderstanding. On a day the other day, uh, Germany produced 75% of its power from coal, and England was 100% renewable. Don't, don't buy the myth that Germany leads the energy vendor. Uh, we uh, always buy that German myth every time. Yeah, we are, if, you, if, if you need any help on, on, on programming <laughs> software for your, so, for, your, for your cars, give us a call. Uh, we're very good. We're, we're world champion, not just in soccer, but also in cheating a little bit. Uh, yeah. Um, so so the, I think the great news is a friend of mine, Hermann Scheer, started the feed-in tariff in 2000 when the price per solar panel, sorry, per kilowatt hour of solar was 600 cents per kilowatt hour. And he said I can make it go down factor 100 by scaling. And people thought he's crazy. Today, solar power in Dubai costs 3 cents, which is, sorry, 3 cents. New record, 2.99 cents. It was 5 cents. Two weeks ago, new record, 2.99 cents per kilowatt hour. That's equivalent to $5 a barrel. Just if you want one number from the whole conference, $5 per barrel is what the Abu Dhabi National Bank says is where oil becomes competitive. Now, people say you need oil for transport. One other portfolio company of ours used an electric car, the Nissan Leaf, which costs 25,000 euros, charges at night cheaply and puts power back into the grid, and it makes 2,000 euros per year for the owner. So over 10 years, your car earns you 20,000 20, euros, and you're done. So I believe the free market will get it done. All we need from the politicians is the right to feed into the grid and a bit of money from the pension funds and let the politicians be short, short, short visions with APG and with uh, PKA, I think we can do it easily. And we, there's some tricks we have to play, like you can't invest in, 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 in things that aren't listed. We'll list the thing for you, or you can buy the stock. So, so, so we have a foundation called the 
the, the Air AG Stiftung, the Ruhr Kohle AG Stiftung, they're sitting on 30 billion euros invested in one equity, Evonik. And they should give you a call about portfolio diversification, you know. And we can help them. We have the Norwegian Pension Fund who'll buy that equity and they'll use the money to invest to stop climate change. And all we need is all the guys in the room to keep on pushing so the stupidity of buying oil and gas and coal companies stops. By the way, just the last point on oil and gas, I, I love that idea of selecting the best in class. It reminds me of... Uh, of sort of, uh, you, have a, you have 10 serial rapists in the, in the prison, right? And you look, who's the nicest guy? And that guy let out once a week, you know? Does that sound reasonable to you? It really doesn't. So I really think that divest invest is the only way to go with regard to these I'm going to stop you companies. there, Joachim. You. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows where we can go from here. Okay, listen, I'm gonna, we're going to throw this open to the floor and get some discussion for the last 15 minutes. And I'm going to nail down this discussion, I think, to one particular point that I think we can bring everyone in and hopefully get some questions from you on, because there's a danger with this discussion that it can go in all directions. What, I mean, the, the panel question is, what are the challenges in finding large-scale, good quality, renewable energy investment opportunities, and how can these be overcome? We were having an interesting discussion at lunchtime uh, about what is happening around capital markets union. There is desire for money into infrastructure. Pension funds are saying they have money. What's the problem here? Does anyone have any questions, remarks they'd like to make? If you're going to make a remark, keep it short and sweet, please. But uh, if we have... Uh, everyone's too tired now on this subject, I see. Don't be shy. There'll be one hand and then there'll be ten. So let's take the question over there as quickly as you can, please. Um, and if you have remarks, make them rapid. So very Name. quickly, you have a difficult market right across to the east, Poland. Very difficult, problematically. What do you need to invest? Apart from like political substances, there is money, there is will, there are people on the ground, and they have a very hostile government policy. What, from the financial point of view, if you take the government policy aside, do you need? We've got an even better country we're investing in called Ukraine. We've got the Russian tanks on the right and the wind park on the left. It's great stuff. So every time they shoot, the wind park collapses, we get World Bank insurance and we're fine. So I think it's... it's, it's Let, let's, <laughs> try and, let's try and keep it to perhaps easier scenarios to paint rather than more <laughs> difficult ones. Let's uh, see what else we've got. I mean, um, t actually, Pella... Tell us what the issue is here for you as a pension fund. You're saying, listen, the money is there. We need mm. to figure out whether these investments work for us. W what are the challenges there? I mean, you described one. Your government's just turned around and said, we're not going to do any more wind farms. Yeah. And yet you were the, 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 the guiding breeze we're of not. wind farms you know, a few years um, back. I think what we have to remember is that um, you need a company that is able to operate all these solar farms, these wind farms. That's why Dong Energy has been so successful. Because they're able to present uh, to PKA or other institutes and investors uh, a one-stop shop. They do all the project development um, and they operate the wind farms. It's very easy for a pension fund as PKA to invest in that kind of project. But what when it comes to solar parks in developing countries, in Germany, in Denmark, whatever. You don't have those kinds of companies at the same level as Dong Energy, for instance. Um, and they are definitely the leader. So if you had uh, a company where you could, able, you could really say this is a plug and play game, um, and you could mirror that kind of setup to Denmark, um, to India, to China, that would be very attractive. You just don't have that kind of company. Dong, Dong they only operate in, in Europe. They're moving into the U.S. now, but what if Dong decided to go into India or China or whatever? Um, then you would have, as a pension fund, a, a trusted partner where they have shown they're able to, to manage these kinds of operations. Okay, Hendrik, well, uh, just before you come in, Manuel, Hendrik, you're an investment analyst. You, you know what the, the um, potential for companies like Dong Energy and others to be out there and operate at profit is. Uh, I suspect you've looked at these kind of things. What, 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 why aren't there more of them in the market? That's too difficult for me, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> but um, what I can, can say is, and I think that brings us a little bit to the core of the problem, and that is that the institutional investment market is focusing uh, on liquid asset classes, and that is listed equity, listed bonds, sovereign bonds, and so on. So, And here we have the point. I mean, uh, 
as a, so and it's not about Is that true though Hendrik I see loads of investors piling into private equity at the moment these are, these funds are raising 30 yeah, but billion, look at, 15 billion look at the allocation of course this is happening but if you look at the global asset allocation, about what numbers are we talking here? I mean, it's it's a, a debt investment, so list, mostly listed bonds. I think it's 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 around. Correct me, you probably have better numbers, but it's probably sixty percent, and then thirty percent listed equity, something like that, and the rest is divided between infrastructure, private ed, equity, venture capital, and for good reason. And it's also enforced by the regulator. Yeah, we talk about Solvency 2, Basel 3, and so on. And, and there's a clear focus of uh, financial market regulation on liquidity. And this is a perfect rational behavior of large asset owners to have uh, in the current environment. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but in the current environment to have a high degree of liquidity in their portfolios. They, they have no other option. So these other alternatives, so they are called alternatives collectively, there's a good reason yeah, for, for that situation. And if we want to change this, we need to change the, in, uh, uh, the uh, institutional framework these uh, uh, actors are operating in. So one good area that maybe people could look at lobbying on uh, are the regulations that are maybe preventing pension funds from looking more long term uh, and thinking about um, investing in what would seem to be eminently sensible green long term infrastructure projects. Manuel, talk to us about the challenges on the green bonds side to yes. scale this up. I mean, in the bonds world, that your green bonds are seen as a, a minnow area in comparison yes, to the amount of debt. Indeed, thank you. I mean, talking about this, I get the impression we're making things very complicated now, and I think we need to scale back and make it simple, simple, and simplest. If we want to get big money coming in, we have to lower the hurdles and the barriers to pull that money in. Remember, we have a funding gap of roughly three trillion, trillion US dollars a year in the next few years to fund the green stuff we need to put on the planet to save us all. I live one meter below, uh, uh, below well, in the future maybe, but one meter above sea level. The airport in my country is seven meters below sea level, right? So we need to pull in money as quickly as we can. And private equity, venture capital, what we're talking about today it seems like that's all fine. But indeed, the big pockets of money, as you say, are other stuff. It's fixed income. The fixed income market is 100 trillion in depth and breadth, and that's the money we need. So what's the challenges we have in front of us? We have the NDCs, the National Determined Contributions, agreed in Paris in December. The countries have said what they want to do. But it's only worth, it's only plans. It's only worth something if you turn those things, those plans into reality, which means putting a huge amount of assets and projects in those countries very quickly at scale. You can only do that if you bring in private capital. China says they need $600 billion in the next five years just to clean up the environmental mess. They need another $600 billion just you know, to fund the transport needs they have. And they can only do it with 15% public money. The rest has to be private. And then you need the deep markets. What do you need to get there? One, make product. Two, make sure the product comes in the right types at the right price in the right quality. Seems easy. One, make products. So turn those climate pledges into country infrastructure investment plans. What do those countries want to do and how are they going to do it? Then translate it into financial products. Different green bonds in different types, project bonds, securitization, all that more complicated stuff. Offer it two investors at the right price. We see the first price differences emerge in the market. They are the first investors paying a premium for green that will hopefully build and also manage investor perceptions around risks. If you want to go indeed and invest straight ahead in some windmill in far of India and you don't know the Indian market, you don't understand, you don't have offices, sounds complicated. If, however, you in lend money to Electricité de France on their global balance sheet and they do the stuff for you there, they are good, well, that sounds easier. And in the end, make sure that when the package says there's green inside, that really there is green inside. That's the standards we're working on. 
Thank you very much. We have to wrap up there, um, unfortunately, but it leaves a lot of food for thought uh, out there and for further discussion. Um, so I think from my perspective, this is one of, of course, the most important questions out there. How do you mobilize capital, genuinely public-private partnership capital over the long term for uh, sustainable infrastructure? Uh, and I think it's one of those areas that behoves us all to be thinking about bringing solutions uh, to the table. Thanks to the panelists uh, for their interventions. Thanks to you. Uh, and we'll hand over to, to Catherine for uh, the next one.